everyone and welcome back. I am here in last week's very vampiric vesti to bring you the epic video of making the most spooky, gothy, epically dark Edwardian pair of shoes ever. I have to admit I am rather impartial to this particular era of shoes as I do find that the late 19 teens and early 1920s in my mind is the peak of women's shoemaking. They just have the most epic styles. There are beautiful simple pumps with gorgeous toes and curvy heels. There are grand tall boots with all sorts of cutouts or crazy straps. You have very skeletal shoes. You have amazing oxfords. You have shoes with grand tongues that curve up over the instep of the foot. And you have shoes that seem to really almost encapsulate all of these elements all in one. So the styles that are available are just glorious and I need something to go with my 1914 ensemble that will be coming next week and if you have not seen it it is very dark and spooky and it really needs an appropriately aggressive pair of shoes to go with it. I started doing most of my research looking at similar fashion plates to that ensemble, trying to see what sort of shoes they put with them. The problem there is that they usually just show simple pumps, because why would you render a very dramatic shoe that is not the thing that is for sale? So we had a bit of a problem. I started then looking at other shoes of that time period, trying to find fashion plates that specifically focused on shoes, advertisements, originals, and I kept coming back to this very skeletal style or a type that had a very tall tongue over the instep. And I couldn't quite find exactly what I wanted until I came back around to this particular image that I have spent many hours of my life staring at. If it's familiar to you too, there is a reason for that. And honestly, I am in love with every single pair of shoes on this fashion plate, and that's why I decided to pull that one particular design off of that plate before. But for this particular project, there was a different shoe on this plate that really spoke to me. And I admit, this technically is from 1919, but it holds many of the same elements that you see throughout the mid to late 19 teens. So I'm going to fudge this a little bit because they're just the perfect shoes and I need them beyond just this outfit. So with that in mind, we now have a tiny little illustration that shows us almost no details to go off of. That means we need to do some more research. So let's look at some originals that might be able to give us a little bit more of a frame of reference. First off, what sort of leather are these shoes made out of? There certainly were ones that were made out of silk satin in this time period, but this seems to be a very high shine leather. And glazed kid seem to be sort of the standard for leathers when it comes to black shiny shoes. It's not quite as shiny as a patent leather, but it definitely has a very distinct sheen to it. I do actually have an original pair of boots from around this era that have that sort of leather. So I couldn't find glazed kid exactly like I wanted. That was easy for me to order on the short notice that I needed it. So instead I ordered a glazed goat skin, which has a very similar finish. It's just going to be a little bit more bumpy, but it's a good weight, it's a good stretch, and I think we'll do just perfectly for this project. Next, we have to deal with those little weird triangular side panels. Since this is such a high shoe, it goes up so far over the foot, you need some way to get it on and off. It clearly doesn't lace up or button up, so that means that those side panels are elastic. And there are plenty of examples of surviving shoes with a little elastic panel on the side. It seems to be sort of a trendy style around this time period. So I'm going to be going with that option. As for the rest of the actual construction techniques, I have looked at a lot of original shoes from this era, sort of peeked inside of them, looked at all the details that I could. I still pulled up a lot of reference images that I needed for some specific elements of these shoes. And like I said, I do have a few originals in my collection from around this time period that can give me some basis for the actual construction techniques. And I have actually made one other pair of shoes from this time before. So I used my knowledge from the research that I did for those shoes and some of my other originals and images and pieced together an idea of how these shoes were actually made. 
Now, none of this matters if I can't complete the first step, which is to have the appropriate shape and fit of last. Now, if you don't know how shoes are made, they are not made the same way that clothing is made, where you come up with patterns, stitch the pieces together, and they sort of come up with a shape based off of that. Instead, shoes are made over a last, historically a wooden last, and they are sort of formed and shaped and curved and stretched and molded and sculpted over this last. It gives them their final shape. So it has to be just right. It has to not only fit your foot comfortably, but it has to be the right shape for the final shoe. And while I have carved lasts before, they tended to be 18th or 19th century styles, much more simple. A lot of them were straight last, meaning they don't have a right or left. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated because shoes of this era get pretty curvy. And me being the masochist decided to go with the ultimate shoe shape for this era, that of the Yantorni shoe, where it is the most epically curvy style that you can possibly find. And I just, I need it. And I know I'm gonna suffer for it, but I need it. <laughs> and I need to make so many shoes on this last. So I am going to be figuring out this incredibly complex, curvy, unusual shape of last to create this very dramatic pair of shoes in the end. And oh, this has been a journey. I've been working on this for close to two months at this point. I planned on this video coming out three weeks ago, but it has taken me a lot longer than I originally expected, but that's okay. That means that it's coming out correct and it's coming out how I envisioned it. And I get to share with you all of the hours and days of work that have gone into this pair of shoes. And I really hope that you enjoy all of this as much as I have, because the result is just everything I could have ever hoped for. So let's get started with carving out that last, because I can't really do much until that's complete. But first, have you ever wondered how it is that I managed to make a project, film it, and edit it all within one week repeatedly while still managing to be a functional human being? Well, the answer is in no small part due to HelloFresh. It's something that I have come to rely on completely to make sure that I manage to eat healthy because otherwise the thought that I would have to discover new recipes, come up with a grocery list, go to the grocery, find all of the ingredients that I need, and then still go through the process of actually cooking all of that food. It is just not a successful way for me to manage my life. So instead, every week I rely on HelloFresh to provide me with all of the ingredients that I need and new recipes. All I have to do is go to their website, choose from usually over 20 options for meals, what day it gets delivered on. There are vegetarian options, low calorie options, so many different choices. And that doesn't even include the fact that there are extra add-ons like sides or quick lunches or desserts and even their most difficult meals are usually only 30 minutes to prepare and if I know I'm going to have a particularly rough week I go with the oven ready and the quick serve meals which only take 10 to 20 minutes and they are just as tasty so the fact that I can just throw together with almost no effort a great dinner that I can feel good about and feel good after eating is just a wonderful thing to me and if you you've ever thought about trying HelloFresh, this is the perfect time because today you can actually go to HelloFresh.com and use code 12Nicole to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. So go try this out. See all the recipes that are available because there are so many great options for everybody. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code 12Nicole to get 12 free meals. And with that, I'm going to go make up some charred tomato and ricotta toast from my box for lunch and get back to work. While I have made historical lasts before, I have never made a last specific to this era, in no small part due to the fact that they are very complex. They have lots of curves and difficulties, and getting the fit just right for the particular heel height that you need is incredibly complex. There is a reason why last making is considered a separate skill and trade from shoemaking. So I dove into this with a lot of hope and relied more on my knowledge of sculpting than on the more mathematical systems that they use for last making today. I started with a very large block of basswood. It is something that is honestly a little too lightweight for a good shoe last, but it's something that I can carve easily and it will make it through a few pairs of shoes without too much damage. 
as long as I'm sure that this fits me after a pair or two, then I can send it off to actually be copied by a professional last maker in the appropriate wood. And they'll do that by machine rather than having to do it by hand like I've been doing with hand saws. And fortunately, I do have an occipital sander, which means that I don't actually have to carve everything and sand everything down to get the right shape, but everything does end up just a little bit dusty in the garage. From there, I can start to actually build up the structure of the shoes. One of the interesting things for heels of this era that I found is that they make use of cardboard in the shank area, meaning that when you have a high heel, you need something to support the shape and the arch of the foot. So today we tend to use fiberglass or a metal shank for this area. Historically, all of these shoes that I've managed to sort of peek underneath the insole in for this era, tend to use either a single piece or even multi layers of pasteboard. I personally really like layering up the cardboard that I'm using just because it allows me to get a sort of laminated shape that is very durable and very curvy. So once I've cemented all of those layers together and it dries, I then go in and sort of shape up some of the corners and edges so that way it's a little bit more smooth and there won't be any lines to press through the sole at the end. I can also start working on the actual pattern for the uppers. There are lots of different methods to do this. You can wrap it in paper, you can take a simple shape off the last and then actually draw up the upper shape on paper. I also really like this particular method of covering the last in masking tape and then drawing the actual shoe shape on. This is really useful when you're dealing with complex shapes that are kind of hard to visualize in a flat format. For this one, I wasn't really sure how it would look in a flat format while the base of it is a pump. The tongue is a little unusual and I wasn't exactly sure the best way to go about seaming these things together and making sure that I could actually get a viable pattern off of them. As you can see here, I can't make this in a single piece. I can't even make it just in two pieces. The tongue has to be something separate and I do have to put a seam on the interior portion or what we call the medial side of the shoe. So there is a small seam there so that way it's not overlapping and I also have to seam the tongue on, which honestly is a good thing because that tongue is really complicated and it's going to take a lot of stitching and cutting and being able to do that as its own separate piece is going to make this a lot easier. Once I've come up with the general shape from the masking tape and I've put little relief cuts into it to make sure that it is large enough, knowing that the leather will stretch in ways that the masking tape and paper cannot, I gradually transfer it over to paper, clean it up, and then transfer it over to that same sort of heavy mat board that I used for the internal structure of the shank. This allows me to cut it out with an X-Acto knife and have very clean, crisp edges and that is really helpful when I'm tracing this out multiple times onto a piece of leather or fabric. It's much more durable and long lasting of a pattern that way. It also helps me to go ahead and cut out all of those fiddly little openings so that way I can trace them out perfectly onto the tongue. It's a very lengthy process, but it will really make a difference in the end. Before I get around to actually cutting out the upper though, I'm going to go ahead and cut out my reinforcement pieces. So this particular style will actually have a little toe cap as well as a heel cup, meaning that these little extra pieces of very stiff leather will sit in between the lining and the exterior and will help just reinforce those areas to make sure that they don't collapse, that they stay nice and structured. This is very typical in lots of eras of shoes, but is pretty much a standard in women's shoes as of the 20th century. All I have to do to shape them is to wet them down and 
tack them into place over the last to make sure that they end up with the correct curve, let them dry there, and then they'll be added to the shoe during the construction process. I did realize I had a problem when it came to the broguing, however. I left a very tiny seam allowance to be folded over the top rather than leaving a raw edge of the leather, and that meant that you could visibly see where the edge of the turnover was going to be, so I needed to sort of block off those holes, and I chose to do this with a satin ribbon, and that also functioned as a stay tape, essentially, around the upper part of the shoe, which is a very common thing to add in, so that way it doesn't stretch over time. When it came to dealing with that very complex tongue, I realized it would be so much easier for me to go ahead and stitch the lining and the exterior leathers together at the same time, then cut out the holes. So that way I'm not dealing with lining those up or the fact that there is no way that I could manage to cut all of those tiny little slits open exactly the same in the lining and in the outer leather. And this was just a much faster and easier way to deal with that. It just meant that I would have to be a little bit more careful in my cutting at the end. One of the key features that I was a little concerned about here was the elastic. I still really hope that there's enough sort of allowance that it doesn't pull out of the seams. There's only a little bit under a quarter of an inch, but it seems to be fairly secure. It just gets inserted between the two layers and top stitched around the edge so that way it is nice and stable. And the other side of the elastic will eventually get sandwiched in between the lining and the outer leather. Speaking of the lining, I'm just cutting part of it out of a thin black leather that I happen to still have a little bit left over. It seems like most of the linings for black shoes in this era were either black leather, brown leather, and or a fabric down in the toe area of the shoe. Nearly all of my examples have a twill fabric or a canvas fabric down at the toe area. It's a place where you're not going to see the interior. It's lightweight, it means that it's fairly flexible, not too stiff, and it is much cheaper than leather. So I just use a cotton twill. I then went ahead and taped in the tongue to the lining so that way it would stay nice and stable as I worked with stitching the rest of the uppers together. Tape like this is very common in modern shoemaking and it's a much faster and easier way than gluing all the pieces together and then stitching. It doesn't really seem to gum up my machine needle too much, thankfully. 
and it just makes everything so much more secure than just clips. The next piece to prepare is the insole. Very typically they do this out of an incredibly lightweight leather that gets cemented to that pasteboard. I wanted something that had a little bit more substance to it if for no other reason than this would give me a slightly cushier shoe for a lot of walking. I have found with a lot of vintage and antique shoes they just really are incredibly lightweight so I wanted to add that little layer of cushioning of a decently weighted insole leather. And to that we're just cementing down the cardboard and then the next step I get to do is the actual lasting process which is the most exciting part because this is when it starts to look like a real shoe. This is not an easy process by any means but it is totally worth it. Basically the entire thing is done by gradually working the different layers and pulling them around making sure everything stays up center, tacking down different sections, and after you get the whole thing loosely tacked down, you then have to pull out most of the tacks, pull back the exterior, and make sure the lining alone is very secure and smooth. Since the lining very often will have a different stretch than the exterior will. So we'll go ahead and make sure that everything is secure and in the correct position, because the last thing we want to do is last just the lining and find out that it's skewed and off. And then you go to actually finish lasting the uppers and it's all wrong and you can't go back and fix that easily. So we want to make sure everything is secure and in the correct position. And then we can actually work on smoothing everything out, getting the layers to lie as flat as possible, trimming them back, cementing them down, whatever needs to happen to make sure that everything is smooth and as low profile as possible.
also have to deal with covering the heel. Thankfully, this is just one layer of very stretchy leather, so it's not too difficult to work the leather out and around. I've wet it down so it's extra stretchy. And I'll actually go ahead and cement the center back section so that way those two pieces are very well joined and not going anywhere, nicely centered up. And from there, I can tug and pull and force the leather around so it's nice and smooth on the sides, cement those down, and then the heel itself will actually get not only cemented on, but later nailed in as well. So, so it will be very secure, but it is done in what is called a knock-on style, meaning that the heels are done up separately and then applied to the shoe, rather than stitching the heel cover to the shoe and pasting the heel into that heel cover, which is already attached. This way is so much faster than that 18th century method of stitching everything together. Trust me on that, this is so much easier to deal with. All we need to do is make sure that it gets cemented down to the precise location in order to get the right balance and shape, and it pretty much instantly bonds together and is stable enough to finish the construction process. We just need to put a few nails in it before it gets worn to make sure that the heel doesn't dislodge itself. The outsole in this particular case, I'm leaving fairly thick at the edges. I'm still working it down really thin over the area where it curves up around the heel. Now there certainly are soles that stop before the heel, but this particular style curves under the heel breast and around. So it needs to be very thin in that area. All I've done to prep the sole is to actually sand it. So it's a suede feel. And then the edges are actually done up in burnishing ink, which is sort of like a lamp black. And those are burnished and shined up, so that way they're nice and smooth. The original image that I looked at seemed to have black edges, but a natural colored sole. It seems to be the standard method that I find on shoes of this era. So I chose to do this method because it gives a very nice finish. It seems to be fairly common on a lot of the antiques that I've examined. One of the last major steps is pulling the last out. Now, I don't have the ability to make this a three-part last like they historically very often would have been, or a broken last, meaning that it can sort of bend and come apart in different ways to remove easily. Instead, I just sort of have to work the shoe off of the last as carefully as possible. I did manage it, thankfully, for both of these shoes. But it did take a little bit of effort, and I do have to fully admit that I did end up kicking myself in the face at one point. But that's not on video, so we don't need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. 